Welcome to your College Bound Kid, a podcast for parents, college counselors, students, and anyone who wants a weekly deep dive into the world of college admissions. My name is Vince, and I've been doing admissions since 1989 and college counseling since 1998 in California. I'm Lisa, and I'm a clinical psychologist and college counselor. I have a daughter in college, a daughter in high school, and a son in middle school. After 30 years in Chicago, we recently moved to North Carolina. My name is Mark. I'm a college coach in Atlanta and the parent of two daughters, Karis, a graduate of Davidson College, and she is the founder of the Spanish tutoring company, SpanishHelpToday.com. Joy has a bachelor's degree from the University of Georgia and a master's degree from North Carolina State University. She works in private practice in Raleigh as a mental health therapist. And I'm so blessed to be able to work alongside both my beautiful daughters at School Match for You, a college counseling firm that I founded in 2010. This week in the news, I continue my conversation with Matt Bonser, the Director of Admission at Colorado College. And we're talking all things gap year as Matt answers 20 frequently asked questions about gap years and gap semesters, part three of three. Our question from a listener comes from Laura from D.C. She's asking for tips about college fairs. Our interview is with Hannah and Nora. It's also part three of three, and they are college coaches at Scholar Match. And they're explaining to us who Scholar Match is and how you can get involved in helping a gifted and talented under-resourced student. And friends, for a college spotlight, it'll be part two of two. Kevin Newton breaking down St. Andrews University in Scotland. I know on Monday I said it would be Marquette University, but I forgot we still had a part two for Kevin. But come back the next two weeks and you'll hear the Marquette spotlight. Friends, I have a few announcements to make today. And both of them have to do with my esteemed colleague, Susan Tree. So I mentioned to you on Monday, and if you missed that, that uh, Brennan Barnard of Forbes did a tribute to Susan. And we're going to put the link in the show notes. And he had a fantastic name for it. He called it Mentors Among Us, The Giving Tree. Did you get that? The Giving Tree. So it's very special to me. Brennan and Susan and I all worked together from 2001 to 2004. And I think you really would enjoy reading this. So we had a listener who reached out and said, you know what? It's one thing when when you do your hot seat and your lightning round and we get to know something about the interviewers, uh, the interviewees, but I kind of want to know more about the co-hosts because I hear from the co-hosts every week. So it's a great opportunity. I think you'll learn a lot of things about Susan. I'll put the link in the show notes. Strongly encourage you to check that out. All right. Speaking about Susan, on Monday, Susan uh, dropped some serious wisdom on us as she took us through uh, six questions to really ask yourself when you're trying to decide uh, which college to attend. And they all start with the letter F. Well, when we were talking, she said she'd send over like the slides with a little bit more detail for the show notes. And guess what? That never made it in the show notes. I was going to wait till Monday, but I thought, why not get it in there now? So we'll get that up in the show notes. So two things to check out in the show notes, both the the article from Brennan, Mentors Among Us, The Giving Tree, as well as some more details on the six Fs involved in selecting a college when you're having a tough time deciding which college to select. All right, let's transition to my conversation with Matt. Friends, in the final part of my interview with Matt Bonser, where we're answering all FAQs I could think of about the gap year, we start out by asking the question, should a student reapply? to a selective school they didn't get in the following year after they take a gap year. Matt tells us when this actually can sometimes work. Matt gives his thoughts of a student who takes a gap year in high school. Matt talks about Verto, a third-party provider of study abroad experiences. He tells us what he likes about Verto and why CC is partnering now with Verto. I asked Matt to give his feedback on two concerns I frequently hear from parents when it comes to gap years, and he gives an answer. Finally, Matt shares what he learned about the college process himself by going through it as a parent this year. Listen and enjoy. Do you find that if a student is not admitted at your school and then they do their thing 
and then they apply again the next year. How, 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 what, are, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I've, I've heard from some very selective schools that the chances that so much could have changed in such a short period of time sure. is, is unlikely. And, and this, I encounter this as a counselor too, because people sometimes come to me, you know, in these circumstances when they want to transfer. And sometimes they'll want to apply to their highly selective school they never got in the first time. And I try sure. to sort of temper those expectations. What, what are your thoughts on that? So, yes, it can work, but it depends, right? Like that's sure. the, the favorite sure. admission answer. Sure. Took however many minutes for that uh, phrase to appear <laughs> uh, in this conversation. But, you know, I think about here's a scenario of a student who applies as a senior in high school in regular action, you know, with a mixed grade record. They're a good student. They certainly can do the work, but we're super constrained. Our admit rate for regular is under 10%. And you know, we just, we can't say yes, given uh, the the number of regular action candidates this year that student then appears in next year's early decision pool. Well, early decision has a much more favorable admit rate at CC. So there's an advantage. I guess I would argue though, strategically for the student, like, yes, you know, moving from a non-binding round to a binding round matters at CC, but what do you have to say that's new and different, right? I'm reading these cases right now. I'm reading a bunch of students who are reapplying using exactly the same personal statement that we read last year. All right, well, what was the result last year? Was it what you wanted? If not, you might want to redo that personal statement and potentially talk about what you've done in that time since you applied. So what are you doing on that gap year? How did you use your summer for that film project? What are you doing this fall for working on a political campaign? Bring us new and relevant information. That doesn't change your academic record, although we will have a final transcript. I hope you finished out the, you know, the <laughs> end of your senior year strongly. But you know, tell us something new, and that may have an impact. So I think th that combination of factors, right? Somebody who had a mixed academic record but really finished out senior year strong, somebody who had a you know, typically good personal statement that tells us something new and different about their gap experience that's maybe a little bit more exciting uh, than when they were a senior, maybe somebody who applied non-binding, who's now in a binding round. All of those things can sort of nudge the likelihood in their favor. Um, so is it guaranteed? No, but it can be helpful. Yeah, especially that going from non-binding to binding, you know, that that's a that's a major sure. major factor. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes Matt, I'm asked about a a student taking a gap year while in high school. Uh, you know, sophomore to junior year and doing similar kinds of experiences just doing it within high school. What are your thoughts on that? I think it can work, but I I think, you know, that that is for for us a little bit of tread with caution. And once they apply for admission, right, because their gap year is completed, we'd love to know the story, right? That That's my job is to hear sure. students' stories, whatever sure. they might be. And rather than gloss over it, like I want students to take advantage of whatever open space in the application, whether that's the disruption section or the additional info or separate message to to their territory rep, whatever that might be, and to have that echoed by their school community, especially to talk about, you know, somebody taking a gap year, but, you know, from, you know, their, their sophomore year into their junior year and having a, a gap in between. It's like, well, what were they like before they left and how did they come back, right? Having some of that external validation around development of maturity, independence, global mindedness, skill set, whatever that might be, uh, we'd want to hear that from their other supporters as well. Um, but don't, I, I guess I would, my advice is don't be shy about it. 
let's talk about it. Well, like, what were you experiencing that caused you to take advantage of that? What did you get out of it? Like, did it succeed? How are you now showing up in, in school in a different way? Um, so it can work, right? That's just part of a student's story. There are lots of, of different reasons. And, and certainly in the last four years, we've seen a lot of, of health and safety concerns bubble up there. Um, and it, it's really helpful for us to understand where that student was at, how they took care of themselves, how they came back into, into their community, how they're going to show up in ours. That's really what we're trying to to answer. And if that's part of a student story, like we'll work with it. Now, Matt, you've already shared some really helpful uh, resources on GAP. Uh, you and I were communicating a few days ago, uh, back and forth, and we both have noticed a rise in the Virto uh, GAP program. Right. And, um, you know, I, I know I've had a chance to talk to them. I can't, all these conferences get mixed up to me, whether it was SACAC, NACAC, College Board, but, you know, they set up the booth and the table right, and you pick right. their brains and, you know, just looking, I know they, they promise a lot, you know, they say, hey, we'll give you an international experience and you'll, you'll stay on same, your same pace. So you don't delay your graduation. Right. They talk about that. They say there's some potential financial aid available and you don't have to plan everything. We'll plan everything for you. And then they talk about their 60 college partnerships that, that, um, that they have, have, um, what, what can you tell us about the, the, the Virto program? Right. So we signed up with them last year. So we're still relatively new and they're, they're a relatively new organization. There are a, a number of other, uh, I guess I would call them third party providers or, or, or partners that, um, uh, have been in the study abroad space for years, like CIEE, Global Citizen Year, and so on, that are that are doing some similar um, activities, I think in a very different way um, than Virto, right? They're coming from that study abroad space. Virto was really built for students right out of high school. So different sort of origin story. Um, and yeah, w we think they present uh, some really interesting potential for our winter start and gap years for part of that experience. If students would like to, um, we still, you know, if, if we're making a, an offer for alt start, ours are not conditional offers. Students are free to do what they want, but we see Virto as, as an opportunity where yes, they can get a full semester's worth of credit. They we have our, an articulation agreement to bring that into CC because graduating on time is often a priority for students. Not always, but often. Um, and so that can be advantageous uh, for students to take advantage of. And knowing that that credit has already been pre-approved, where somebody doing their own opportunity, many of those uh, will, will transfer in credit, but students have to do some of the legwork once they arrive here. Um, so we see that as a, a way to sort of front load uh, study abroad, not as the only experience, but potentially as a, you know, a first year experience and then again toward junior year um, and, and maybe having more global experience um, in our student body. My understanding is that about half of the students who participate in Virto are already to are, are already committed to an institution like CC. And so they're going to flow right into our community, whether after a semester or after a year. Um, the other half, though, are, are, are doing what you were talking about, of graduating from high school. I'm ready to commit to Virto. I'm not ready to commit to a college or I'm not satisfied with my options. I'm going to go into Virto and potentially apply through their pipeline with one of those 60 partners and, and hope that the combination of my secondary experience and my Virto experience makes me a more compelling, complicated, uh, exciting candidate. Um, those students technically make their way into our transfer population in a way they're, they're sort of in a mid murky middle ground, right? Because they are accredited through a U.S. university we all know they're not planning to graduate the via Virto. Um, so they're, they're sort of a, a hybrid cohort that we think is pretty interesting to have students who have global experience and um, 
you know, they have college level coursework now under their belt and may, especially for a student who has sort of a mixed academic record, they can kind of prove themselves a bit in the Virto curriculum to show a place like CC. I, I really am poised to thrive academically and globally going to bring a perspective that I may not have had coming fresh out of high school. So it sounds like it does have the potential to maybe strengthen an applicant's application. You know, that's what it sounds like I'm hearing. I, I it's not a so. given. It's not a guarantee, I, but you get an international experience. Certainly, or some more. No, it's, mm-hmm. it's not a guarantee. But yeah, I think about that degree of, of global mindedness, of independence, of following an individualized path. Those are all things that we value in our candidate pool. And so uh, I'm I'm excited at the prospect that we'll have more and more students, whether our winter start and gap year students take advantage of it or those students who, who find their way through that transfer pipeline. Um, we're, we're pretty optimistic about it. I know they've signed on a, a huge number of partners um, and are building capacity ac- across the globe. Uh, so, you know, I'm... As somebody who values global education, like I hope for all of our sake that that thrives um, in uh, that transition marketplace between secondary education and post-secondary in, in whatever of those forms. Matt, I'll tell you a couple of concerns I sometimes hear and tell me if you think this say, you know, this is reason to be concerned. Sometimes I hear concern from parents that if my student takes a gap year, I don't know if they'll go to college. They're going to get caught up in, you know, right. being away and out of the school reg- regimen. And, and so I hear that sometimes. Uh, another concern sometimes is if a student ends up taking a lot of college classes, they're now not considered a first year admit. They have to be considered a, in the transfer pool. Can you can you talk about uh, you know, both of those and tell me what your thoughts are? Yeah, and I suspect, right, the, the variety of higher ed is is broad. And so what we see with a very high enrollment rate is not necessarily what every other higher ed institution uh, experiences. So I, I do want to acknowledge that we're we're in rare territory in that regard. Um, and so even as much as we're very pro-gap year, that's reflective of, of who we are as an institution and the kind of candidate pool that we see and that other institutions with other candidate pools might be seeing wildly different results. And so that's why the individual conversations are so important. So our experience, though, is that students do show up and, well, their major might not match what they listed on their Common App, they have more direction than they would have otherwise had. So we see really good results out of that. It's a concern. And and I think, you know, as families are engaging in this conversation, they know their students better than we do and need to really have that conversation of what are you running toward? And have you set up a college choice that as you continue to learn about yourself is still going to be a good fit? Because if that's sort of murky, it may not be to a student's advantage to commit via that gap year. And it might might actually be advantageous to just wait to apply from that gap year, even knowing that there are some trade-offs there, right? And um, But in, in our experience, our students are excited to get back into higher ed. They just want to exercise a very different part of their, their brain and their body um, during that span of, of time. And then the question Remind about the transfer, yeah, the, yeah, the second on. one was just oh, the transfer. Yeah. Like, can you get put into the transfer pool because you took courses for credit um, at a school? Is that something that people need to be mindful of? It is something they need to be mindful of. Thinking about what their status is at that other institution and how a student is able to frame that experience. Because if we're getting a transcript that looks full-time-ish, degree-seeking-ish, those are non-technical terms, obviously, like we're going to say, oh, this looks like a student who started college, first and foremost, and who 
might be working or volunteering or interning or whatever on the side, having a student who is taking a class or two and looks more like a non-degree seeking student who is primarily doing a gap, that looks much more like a first year. So that's in the scenario where they've taken the time off and now are applying fresh during their gap year. Yeah, I think that is something that students should be really careful of. And to clarify, I remained a part-time, non-degree-seeking student on a gap year that's much more likely to be looked at as a first-year candidate. Someone who, you know, is in a full-time curriculum, we might say, yeah, you look a little bit more like a transfer student. Um, Or you might be maxing out the amount of credits that you can bring to us as a first year student, there may be some reasons why students might want to be a transfer. If they're hoping to bring in AP and IB courses and some of that gap college credit, as a transfer, they may be able to bring more in than they would otherwise as a first year. So that's where, yeah, I think early and often to communicate with their colleges of interest to say, how do you, how do you approach this? Here's my plan. Should I be concerned or how do I articulate this best for you can be really helpful. Matt, this has been awesome. And I'm, I'm all gapped out on questions and that's a lot. Cause usually I can think of uh, a whole lot of things, but I think this has been pretty thorough. Uh, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you would like parents and college counselors that's our that's our group and like you know like you and I said before they our group right. can be pretty weedsy they don't mind you getting into the weeds but any anything that you you didn't say or anything you just want to close on I think we've we've covered the the spectrum but I I'm excited to talk to you next time and and let you know uh what my son chose uh, yes. for for his gap year we'll we'll see how robust his uh request is at some point down the line He's got some time before he needs to decide, but um, it's it's been fun to explore with him and um, think about how he wants to take a gap semester or gap year. So I'll let you know how things turn out. I just thought of one other question I'd like to close on. And I, I, there have been several people I've interviewed that have had a student that have recently gone through the process. And I've got off the interview and I was like, snap, why didn't I ask this question, which I'm going to ask you? What what did you learn about the college process as a parent going through it, seeing it through that lens that just maybe felt a little different than when you're in the weeds as an admission officer and now you're in it and you're in parent mode? Is there any perspective that you gleaned? Yeah, and I mean, confirmed one thing that I knew, which is that there are so many right answers out there. Um, I I love that. We sort of started with that as a premise, and we looked across so many different institution types, especially, of course, uh, in liberal arts, and found amazing options that are very hard to compare to each other, right? Mm -hmm. Like Mm -hmm. having a a gamut of really good answers is a tough decision. Um, But uh, I I think the, the other aspect that um, I'm thinking about really from the admission officer perspective is really how little time or, or attention span we have of students. We craft all of these very well worded uh, uh, emails and design very fancy applicant portals. And, you know, watching over my son's shoulder, uh, it was interesting to see, uh, how very briefly he would read our emails and how very (laughs) rarely he would log into the portal. Um, And that those things, yes, they matter. We have to do them. But to think about the complexity of all of the colleges vying for his attention and all of like real life happening for a high school senior, um, that some of the nuance gets lost in our messaging um, from, from time to time. Um, And it you know, makes me understand that you know not every student is reading every word in our messaging. I think I knew that already. But uh, you but experienced it, really it firsthand. 
Oh my goodness. Absolutely. By the way, that works both ways because students spend so much time crafting their personal statement. And anytime yes. I've ever sat in a file reading process, man, those things are, are read fast, you know, and I know speed reading is a skill that gets developed, but I think sometimes people would feel the same way the other way around. Like I spent so much time on that and they just whipped through it so quickly. <laughs> so it kind of works both ways. For sure. Awesome, Matt. Thank Indeed. you so much for your generosity. Looking forward to seeing you again. You're going to be in NACAC LA? I probably will. I'll, I'll try then. to try to connect you there. Try to connect there. Thanks again, Matt. Appreciate it. All right. Take care. Yeah. Awesome. And now it's time for a question from one of our listeners. All right, friends, I'm flying solo on this one, this QFL. And you say, why? You never fly solo. Well, it's a time sensitive question that just came in. And I consider it time sensitive because I was asked this question three times this week. So people are getting asked the question and you're thinking, what's the question? Let's play the question and then I'll go from there. Hi, this is Laura from Washington, D.C. My question is, um, my, my 10th grader is planning on attending a college fair soon. Do you have any tips for students and parents on how to prepare in order to make the best use of these opportunities? Thanks for all that you do with your podcast as we find this a really great resource in helping to better understand the college application process. So you say, why are you flying solo? Well, our production calendar, I usually need seven to 10 days minimum because when a question comes in, then I have to reach out to one of our co-hosts to see when they're available. And these are very busy professionals. So maybe that takes four or five days Then we need to record it. Then it needs to get edited. And then it has to go off to Nemanja, the sound engineer for like more edits, like, you know, improving the quality. Like I do content edits, but then there's improvement, the proving the quality edits. So it just wasn't time with this question just coming in. But yet to me, it was an important question. And I know because I'm in the counseling room all the time, my students are going to these fairs and they're asking me this. So I just bumped it up to the top. So here are some tips in no particular order other than the order they just popped into my head, to be really honest. Try to find out in advance who is coming. And when I say try to find out in advance, I'm talking about both the colleges that are coming and the individual representing the colleges. So let's first talk with who's representing the colleges. So just a basic overview. So admission officers, reps, they travel heavily from late August, usually up to around Thanksgiving. And late August tends to be Southern schools that you know, open at the start of August versus schools that open after Labor Day, like you see a lot in the North and other places. And then they do return to travel again when the class is close to getting wrapped up uh, sometime between mid-April to May. There's a number of college fairs and things, and they go on the road then all the way into early June. So often when fairs are up now, it's one of two things. It's one of the really big ones, like the NACAC fairs, which are national fairs. Those fairs are going to be fully staffed with um, admission officers from the school. But there are a lot of small little fairs that happen at this time. Sometimes they're just put on even by one high school uh, or a couple of high schools get together and put them on. And a lot of times at those schools, you'll find a parent or an alumni uh, representing the school. So it's important to know because one, it will influence the questions you ask. And to be perfectly honest, it might even influence whether or not you decide it's worth your while to go depending on if it's going to be a parent, an alumni, or an admission officer. So that's what I mean when I say find out who's representing the school as far as the individual. Now, the other part, find out which schools are going to be there. There's several ways you can do this. If it's a school-based fair, then your high school counselor um, oftentimes will have that information. If it's um, a regional fair um, or even like a national fair, then usually there's websites that have the attendees uh, who are confirmed on there, if it, if, the, if either of those options are the case. Now, one thing you can also do is you can go to a section of the admission portion of a college's website where they say admissions traveling to your area. And sometimes they will also indicate um, will be coming into the area. You can sometimes get the information there. But you're going to want to know which colleges are coming because, one, that's going to partly help you determine if you're even going to go or 
what your strategy is because you want to prep. Part of what you want to do is prep. You want to do research. You want to come in with several excellent questions to ask. And so you can't do that unless you know who's coming. All right. So that's that's one of the things that's really important. Another tip is don't have as your starting point what I see almost everybody has as their starting point, which is what can I do to impress? All right. Have as your starting point, what do I need to know about school X that will help me decide if I even want to apply? Or let's say you know you want to apply. That will help me decide if I may, they may be a consideration for an early decision application if it's a school that have, offers ED and, and ED works for your family financially. So that's important. You know, that's important. And make sure that's your starting point. What do I need to know? Because remember, you're evaluating them just as much as they're evaluating you. So that's really important. Now, before you go, you know, visit, know in mind, I'm going to visit these eight schools, these six schools, these 12 schools. All right. Don't get caught up in just browsing through tables and wandering around at a fair unless you've already gotten to every school that you know and you planned ahead of time. You prepared your questions in advance. Um, and, and don't get caught up in peer pressure, because particularly if it's a school based one, I've seen too much of that. Now, when I say what is a great question, how do you know what great questions are? Well, several things. Great questions are questions that you can't find an answer for when you do a web search. As one of my admissions friends likes to say, if you can't find it with three clicks of a mouse, then that may be a good question. But I've had many a conversation with an admission officer that said, man, I came all the way here, hotel, airfare, rent a car, meals, and I'm getting asked questions that somebody could literally do just a quick little, you know, 90 second search and find an answer to. Like, that's what you call a missed opportunity. And it also doesn't make the best impression. Questions about school culture can be great. And questions about the rep's experience can be great as well. Now, one thing you have to be careful with is asking too detailed questions about a particular program. Sometimes, you know, admission officers don't like that because their thinking is, well, if you want to know, like, you know, how the 15th century med medieval history is taught at our school, you'd probably be better off talking to that professor. Reps are mixed on that. It, there's a lot of factors. How long has the person been there? How arcane is the question itself? So I don't want to just categorically say not to ask anything related to subject matter. Uh, I think that's a little broad, but I wouldn't get too specific. And certainly if you're Tom parents and alum, that's completely off limits for that. Uh, but when I say questions about culture and I say questions about experience, what am I talking about? Well, I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, so an experience question could be, you told me you've been here five years. Uh, why do you keep coming back? What keeps you here? What are the things that, uh, that make you proud to work here? Like those kinds of questions are the kinds of questions that are perfectly legitimate. So, uh, mission officers like asking these questions because the reality is, and I'll never forget this conversation I had with an Amherst admission officer. It was like in 20, maybe 19. He was packing up his table at the end of a fair, a big fair that I was part of here in Atlanta that drew 3,500 students. And he was like, uh, I rarely get asked a good question. Most of the questions are, you know, he gave the examples. Do you have this sport? Do you have this major? What are your average SATs? Like all these kinds of things. Wasted, wasted opportunities. So a great question is an opportunity to stand out. And people enjoy talking about themselves. So you just have to be careful you don't get too personal. I was having a conversation with uh, a family I'm working with a few months ago, and and um, uh, the parents said to me that the we kept asking the rep this question, and 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 he didn't want to answer it. So I was like, well, "What was the question?" Well, I wanted, he said he was a graduate of the school. I wanted to know what his SAT scores are. That's not an appropriate question. You don't ask your rep what their SAT scores are. That'd be like saying, uh, what was your weight this morning when you weighed in on the scale? Like, you just don't go there. So when I say personal, I'm not talking about that personal. It's more about experiences. And culture questions can also be great. Like, that example of that is yeah, a question that I like to ask in my interviews, which is, how would you describe the personality of the school? And there's, there's hundreds of these. I'm just giving you a, a few examples. 
So those questions, those questions can be great. Another thing that's important is know what other programming is also available. So I've been a part of two big fairs on the organizational side. Uh, at West Town from 2003, really through when I left in 11, but I even came back a couple times after. Uh, those are really big, big fairs. Like I remember one year we we had colleges from Rhode Island to Iowa to North Carolina. And like this is all year event kind of thing planning. Um, and then I worked not in a leadership role, but on the team in from 2011 to 2022 at that huge fair I referred to earlier um, here in Atlanta that pretty much, I mean, everybody would come into Atlanta on that week when we would do do this big these big huge fairs and we would draw 3,500 people. Now, I'm telling you that because in both instances here, we had programming. Uh, you want to know what the programming is, if there is any programming. And then there's a fair, another fair in Atlanta, two schools, Sandy Springs in Sandy Springs, Georgia, Rivertown and Sandy Springs that I don't do anything to do with the organization of the fair, but I speak as part of the programming. So for five of the last six years, I have spoken on, um, <clears throat> on different topics uh, related to the college process. And the only time I missed was because uh, my mom's 85th big celebration. So the point is there's programming a lot of times and the programming may be for parents, it may be for students, it may be workshops. Know what that programming is because a lot of times that can be great. You can have some fantastic admission officers, uh, seasoned vets, and you can really, really learn a lot. So find out if there's a programming component. That'd be another tip that I'd have for you. Uh, for parents, I'll just be honest. A lot of reps don't want to talk to parents. Now, the big fair that Susan and I did at West Town, we allowed parents to come in. We didn't have strict prohibitions. But the one that I've been involved here in Atlanta, well, we allowed parents in there from 2011 through 17. But from 17 on, parents weren't allowed in the fair. And that was a decision that was made based on feedback from the admission officers. So that's when we had all that programming for parents. But, you know, a rep doesn't want to talk to a parent when they could be talking to a student. So I, I thought it was a little extreme personally. I, I was not my vote to not allow parents in, uh, but I, you know, others, others felt differently than me. But I would say if you're a parent and you want to talk to somebody, only talk to, to the person if there's no students behind you. And if you're with your student and you come up to a booth or a table, then remember student in the driver's seat, parent in the passenger seat. This is their, this is their journey. That doesn't mean that you don't have some great questions to ask, but uh, one of the things that mission officers are always looking for is, is a student independent? And if a parent kind of overpowers, you know, the, the communication, it really does not allow an opportunity for the student to showcase their own independence. So that's a tip that I have, particularly for parents. Another tip is respect the line behind you. So it's oftentimes an unwritten rule. I wouldn't be talking for more than 90 seconds if there's a long line behind you. It's just it's just not respectful. Uh, it's hard for me to give an exact time because let's say there's nobody behind you. You could talk for 10 minutes. Mission officer would rather talk to you than just sit there twiddling their thumbs. I mean, I've been to fairs when I was on the admission side that were so nonstop for hours that I would go back the previous year and I'd have to come and bring students with me because I couldn't handle the questions. And then I've been to other ones where maybe it's an hour and a half fair and maybe three or four people come by and talk to you. I can tell you the busy ones, they're tough because, you know, you don't, <laughs> I mean, you can barely get a glass of water and let alone go to the restroom or something, but they're, they're actually a lot better and the time goes by a lot faster and you're more productive. Your job is to try to, you know, move people along the admissions funnel. So it's very different if nobody's at the table, table versus everyone's at the table. But if you have a long line, and you'll see that with the more popular schools, a lot of times state flagship schools are really popular at these things. The lines can be extremely long. Another one that I was a part of here up until 2022, I mean, we literally had to give Georgia and Georgia Tech like their own sections. And yeah, and all the biggest brand names in the college admissions would be at this fair, but the state flagships are still the most popular, and they have long, long long lines, but there's other popular schools too. So just be sensitive to that. The fact that, uh, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of like six flags. You go there and it's a really, really long line. 
Um, that's kind of aggravating if you're at the back of the line. So um, read the room, read the room, pay attention. Um, get the contact information of the admission officer. Get their business card if they have it. Because uh, a lot of times you're going to want to follow up. And your information is extremely important. So schools need accurate information. So now things have gone so much more high tech than the fairs that I was organizing back, you know, in Pennsylvania. Uh, nowadays, they're gathering information electronically, either in advance or through scanning. I know the last year, the big fair that I was a part of, we went electronic. It was a big cost. We paid a lot for it, but people love it. And that's really where things are going. Certainly the NACAC fairs and things like that are going to be that way, right? And that is a lot better because one, you don't have to worry about legibility. And um, also you don't waste a lot of time sitting there at a at a fair table filling in a card. But those things are expensive. So if it's a smaller fair, there's probably going to be like a three by five inquiry card. And you got to write legibly. I can still remember, you know, Sandy and Bridget, you know, and, and Lynette, these are three ladies in, in the office complaining, you, you know, you come by, come back from a fair and give them a whole bunch of inquiry cards. And then they couldn't read the data to, to do the input. And there's still old school stuff where stuff's getting handled manually. And so what I like to do, and this is, you should know ahead of time, whether or not, you know, there's going to be a scanning system or you have to enter your information ahead of time, or, or it's going to be collected on an inquiry card. Old school way. Um, what I like to do is bring a sticker and have most of your information on a sticker. Now it's going to need to fit on that card. And I've talked to a lot of different reps about this. They like the stickers over you manually phys physically writing it in with, you know, with your own pen, partly because of illegibility issues. And also you're, you can be cradling a log jam at the table. Like you're wasting a lot of your time sitting there filling out an inquiry card. So there's only one caveat. The one thing that sometimes reps don't like about the sticker is that they might have a question on their inquiry card that they really value. And if you just slap a sticker on and move on, you, they don't get that answer. For example, let's say there's a question on there that says, would it be okay if we sent you text messages from time to time? Well, that's you're not going to think about that. You're not going to put that like on a sticker. You're just not, right? So... Let's talk a little bit about the things that are good to put on the sticker. Remember, you need to fit this on a three and a half by five foot in, uh, inquiry card because a lot of times they're that. Sometimes it may be four by six, but you want to play it safe. Obviously, you're going to need your name, you know, your graduating year, the name of your school, your high school, right? Your email, your cell phone, any college majors of interest, parent name and email. You could do primary parent. and if you're happy with your test scores and you're not going to apply as a test optional applicant, you can certainly put your GPA and your, your test scores on there. And then finally your physical address. Like those are the things that I would put on an inquiry card, but then you also want to look at it. If it's one of these ones that has inquiry cards, look at the card and make sure you didn't miss an important question that they might want. And you still slap the card on and then just answer that one question. It's a lot faster and it's legible. So that's something to, to think about. If affordability is really important to a family, like it is to so many, then I recommend doing the net price calculators before you come. Because if it's a school that exclusively gives the money away in the basis of need, like about 30 to 40 schools do, and you run a net price calculator and the numbers that are coming back are so far outside of your affordability range and there's no potential at merit money, then my advice is don't even go by that school because to me, it's just too tantalizing. To me, it's tantamount to you going to the dealership and they say, what's your budget? And you say 25,000, 30 max. And the next thing you know, you're test driving a $90,000 car. Like that's just not good because it's easy to make a decision on emotions and then try to justify it with logic. So I would stick to schools that are within your affordability range. Now, if a school has merit money, then there's always the potential that you could get merit money. But certainly for those schools that are need-based only, and if you run those calculators and what they're saying is just not even possible, like, you know, that's where the marketing of the school sucks you in. You meet someone who they you like and they like, 
And then next thing you know, you're, you're, you know, you're in a bad state. You're not making financially sound decisions. Don't be too influenced by your friends. When it comes to some other basics, eye contact is very important. Smile is very important. It projects warmth. Thank yous are very important. So you want to end with a thank you. And then follow up with a thank you is also good. And then uh, business casual is kind of a safe way to go for this. No tuxedos, but no torn, tattered, frayed, written on jeans. So, you, you know, you want, to, your dress, you want your dress to reflect your personality. But if you want to know some safe attire, you can't kind of go wrong with business casual. And here's another tip. Don't only visit your reach schools or your stretch schools or your challenge schools, right? These are schools that, in, you know, that chances are better that you won't get in than you will get in. Or any low admit rate schools. I know you think, well, I'm going to be the one to get in. Well, you may be, you may not be, but don't only visit them. You should also be visiting your possibles and targets and some likelies uh, and probables because you might, one, you might end up there. Two, you might find out you really like them a lot more than you think. So visit schools with a range of selectivities. Um, that would be uh, my last advice. So hopefully this was helpful. It's a lot more fun for me when I've got one of my co-hosts with me. Uh, but knowledge is power, and I still bequeath some information on you. Hopefully, you can apply it to the college fairs that you attend. And now, this week's interview with a special guest. And friends, in the final segment with Hannah and Nora, helping us to understand Scholar Match and the unique opportunity you have to get involved with them, Hannah discusses how a coach builds rapport with the student virtually. Hannah lets us know if there are any specialized training to help coaches understand the unique challenges first-gen and under-resourced families face. Nora and Hannah go into more depth about the demographics of the Scholar Match students from a geographic standpoint. Nora and Hannah talk about whether college coaches get training On the University of California's app, the UC app, Hannah shares what are the frustrating parts of being a college coach and working with under-resourced students. Nora talks about what Scholar Match recommends when a student is non-responsive to outreach from the college coach. Nora talks about where an interested potential coach can go to get more information. If this interview didn't answer all of their questions and Nora shares, when will someone who applies to be a coach find out if they were accepted? Uh, I make a personal commitment to Scholar Match. And finally, Nora and Hannah go on the hot seat in our lightning round. Listen and enjoy. So as a coach, what are some tips and strategies you've learned to help sort of build virtual rapport with students? I think goal setting is important or just asking the student what it is that they want. All of the students that I've been matched with, they're very motivated and they have an idea that they're there because they want to get the best college opportunities that they can. Um, And so you'll get a variety of answers from those students. Usually it starts off with something uh, along the lines of, I want to be able to study this in college, this being a particular major or idea of study, whether it's something like pre-dental or pre-med, and then that they want a great financial aid program so that it's not a burden to their family or that they feel the pressure to work a lot while they're in college. And so with those goals, I'm generally going to advise students on the different great financial aid and scholarship opportunities that are available, and they tend to be very motivated to um, fill those forms out and the applications out because that's a part of their goals. It is sometimes happen that um, their goals don't line up exactly with what is mainstream for lack of a better term. For example, I have a student this year who might not have a balanced college list of four years. I'm not sure if it counts to have a, um, a balanced list including community colleges. Her idea is that if she doesn't get into her top choice colleges, which are more matches and reaches, that she'll go to a community college and then go to a four year. And I'm I'm super supportive of that idea, even though it might not be as glamorous as going directly to a four year. 
What about a parent that's listening that has a, a heart for helping students and they think that, you know, yeah, there shouldn't be so, so much of a gap between well-resourced and less resourced students and whatever I can do to help, I would love to be able to do it. But maybe they are thinking, um, I don't have a lot of experience with first-gen students and maybe middle class or upper middle class in a suburban area. Is there any part of the training that sort of helps cover like unique challenges that first gen and under resourced families experience that may be different from well resourced suburban families? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the financial aid component and getting into a college that is yeah specific to that that need of financial aid and also resources for first gen students um, and and possibly ethnic minority students or whatever the label is that the student is interested in. Um, those are important factors of the onboarding process, while financial aid might not be as important to those who um, have more resource background. You want to say anything else on that, Nora? Yeah, and, and that also ties back with the report building piece. Uh, I know there might be that fear of, you know, I haven't really worked with first-gen students, but really that's the most important part with the report building to getting to understand where they come from. Um, empathy, I would really recommend having empathy with these students, understanding that sometimes college isn't a priority for them. Uh, they have a lot of things going on with their family. The financial piece is a significant factor for why a lot of these students maybe might not put college first. I know for me, at least, when I was navigating through the process, it was just, you know, going to whatever college would offer me the most financial aid. It wasn't so much the sticker or the name of the university. That wasn't my goal. A lot of these students do have that aspiration of going to these colleges, but for the majority, we do have students who maybe they just want to go through community college. So really understanding, you know, where they're coming from and their background. And that's, that all could just be had like understood within a conversation. And I think more than anything, if you're coming into this field, not really under like working with these first generation and low income students really to take the time to get to know where they come from. That would be my biggest advice to really understand those backgrounds. And that'll, that'll really be like that guiding point in helping to build that balanced college list more than anything. Talk to me a little bit more about the demographics. So I know that the students are typically going to come from families that make under 80,000. If they're coming from other parts of the country, they're experiencing some success in school, like there's some transcript review that's part of your application process. You may not have an exact GPA, but it sounds like most of the other students are probably, I'm assuming probably like 3.2 to 3.5, uh, a lot of them. Would that be fair to say if they're not 3.5? I've had a lot of 4.0 students as well. Sure. No, I know that. I know you have a lot of kids above that, but uh -huh. I was talking about on the low end, right? On the low end. I'm sure you have a lot of 4.0 students. So so, there, so you have a lot of students who are doing well in school, modest incomes. Um, would you say more than half are from California? Uh, do you know the percentage of California, non-California? And then what's kind of the overall sort of like racial uh, makeup of the students? And I know that could vary from year to year, but People just might be curious. Uh, right now, we have a lot of Hispanic students, Asian students. Um, and what was the other part of the question that you were asking me? Sorry. Yeah, Wait. California, non-California. Okay, so we do have a lot of students that do come from California. But now since we've expanded, I don't know, I see kind of like an even trend with where the students mm -hmm. come from. Since our coaches also come from different states, I know I've done a lot of matching with students that are in New York, in Florida, um, in Idaho, in Texas. So we have a variety of students. I know a majority might be primarily the California areas, um, but I have matched students that are in various states across the country. And a lot of California students especially the stronger ones, they're, they can be very aspirational toward the UC system. Is there any training at all on how to do the personal insight questions or filling out the activity section or just helping people at all with the UC application? There's a document in the student support or the coach support playbook that talks about how to apply to UCs. 
Yeah, and, and we we've had webinars with coaches that have let have told us the experience that they have. They it's these webinars that we have are for our other coaches as well. The coaches that lead them are usually our varsity coaches. We did have a, like a PIQ session where a coach went over the questions and gave his own guidance. So we definitely have those events throughout the year where you know we have different topics that we help guide our coaches through. So all of this sounds so great, but nothing's perfect. So what would you say of the frustrating parts of the job? Um, everyone or a lot of people will procrastinate to a certain extent. So getting that text from a student at like 11 p.m. when their deadline is 11.59 p.m. <laughs> and she's like, there have been times where I have helped the students at that time, but I think now more so um, creating certain boundaries of like, all right, I can do a better job if you give me more than an hour notice. So, um, yeah, just not not trying to sacrifice myself too much at 1130 p.m. on a random night uh, is, is something that, uh, yeah. That, yeah. What, and, what did you want to say, Nora? Go ahead. Yeah, and sometimes the, I, I think for me the unfortunate part sometimes once you help students through with all the applications, they tend to fall off the radar sometimes. And we do have that often where our coaches are panicking. They're like, "I don't know what to do. Like my my student doesn't answer my texts." And it, it's happened to me where you know they just you, you I've helped them with the process, and then they're just like. You know, that's basically what I needed help with. There's students that are like that, that they just wanted that guidance with the applications. And that's completely normal. And we want to reassure the coaches that that's OK. Um, if you've done whatever you can to help them, we have students who just fall completely unresponsive. And we do have a protocol for that where we reach out to the students. And if they don't respond, unfortunately, we have to send them that message of, hey, you know, you haven't you know reached out to your coach in a while. We're we're going to have to, because we have a category where we call them light touch, formally engaged. That means that, you know, they are, aren't responsive, but if the, in the event that they do need help again, then they could still reach out to their coach. Uh, so we just want to like, fair warning to our coaches. If that does happen, that's fine. Um, Cause we do have our coaches who start, you know, getting concerned because they don't hear back from their students. And in those events, sometimes it does happen where, where our students do fall unresponsive. So, I, Nora, I know you. Of, or sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. Okay. Uh, I think also one of the hardest aspects for me to watch, I've had two students um, have refugee status, mm -hmm. and they tend to like not, not be specifically within the FAFSA eligibility, but then also not specifically within California Dream Act or other Dream, other state stream um, financial aid applications. And, um, I, I would wish that those students would be able to get opportunities better than uh, what they're currently getting. But unfortunately, with our current processes, it's not ideal. No, that makes a lot of sense. Now, Nora, you said earlier that counselors have like one to three students. So uh, do they get to say whether it's one, two or three or do you decide? How does that kind of process work? Yeah, they're able to put that in their initial application and the coach profile that they submit. Um, they are able to put whether they want one student, two, three students, whatever it is their preference, uh, they could list that. And we make sure to respect that in the event that we might need to match more students. Uh, this happened this year where we had way more students and we asked for a call to action for our coaches if anybody was willing to support with more students. And we do get coaches who are willing to support with more, but we completely respect whatever it is that you designate on the application. We respect whatever amount of students you could work with throughout the year. So talk to the person who's listening and they're really getting excited because I know we have a lot of listeners who I feel will be interested in this. Um, but maybe they still just have a few other questions. Is there an opportunity at all for like potential volunteers to like come to like a webinar with like Q and A or to, to get their questions answered? Um, what would that look like? Someone who thinks they're interested, but maybe they still just have a few questions that we never answered um, in this interview. 
Yes, we do have volunteer info sessions and we have shared that information on our LinkedIn page and also on Instagram. Um, so if you are interested and you do have more questions, we have an FAQ section at the end of the webinar where you could get your questions answered. So if you are interested, um, those are the places you could look for them, um, Instagram, LinkedIn, and also our website, scholarmatch.org, uh, and get, get involved. I believe that's the... Uh, piece of it of the website that way you could get more info on these upcoming info sessions i believe we're having one next week um, so if you are interested in that i would definitely suggest to join these sessions and friends i want to shout out andrea who's been my point person in coordinating this interview uh, but she gave me the following information sessions to share with you tuesday february 27th 10 to 11 a.m Pacific time and 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern time. And then two sessions in March. Thursday, March 14th, 4 to 5 Pacific time, 7 to 8 Eastern time. And finally, Tuesday, March 26th, 10 to 11 Pacific time, 1 to 2 Eastern time. Uh, Scholar Match is also on Twitter and Instagram, and their website is just scholarmatch.org. Um, and I'm going to put this very important volunteer contact information form they have in our show notes. Let's take a break to learn about Mark's recommended resource for the week. Friends, I went back and forth with you on this recommended resource, uh, whether to include it or not. So this is not new. It came out about a year ago. The New York Times basically released a new college ranking tool. Um, you know how I feel about college rankings. Um, schools that are ranked high are good schools, but that doesn't mean they're good for you. It's about how well the shoe fits your foot. But this one's a little different because it allows you to construct your own customized rankings based on the things that matter to you. And they draw off data from a lot of really reputable sources for the statistical data, including College Scorecard, Opportunity Insights, Niche, and the National Center for Educational Statistics. Uh, they have a database, and it has 900 four-year colleges in there. And they only pick colleges that meet two criteria. They have to at least have 500 students, and they have to at least graduate more than 50% of their students within eight years. So it's pretty generous, eight years, to get to 50% graduation rate. However, that does rule out a lot of schools, especially if you have a lot of non-traditional students and commuters. That's why, you know, you're down to 900 as opposed to several thousand. Now, um, the database also only includes schools that where more than 75% of students attend it full time. And that's going to knock a lot of people out. And they at least had to have data on three of the 10 main sources that the New York Times um, used in their criteria. They also excluded military colleges, service academies, maritime colleges, and special focus colleges, and online universities. So they were excluded. So what were the 10 criteria? Well, net price, which is the bottom line, what you pay, right? Cost of attendance minus any free money, net price. Sticker price, the listed price. Earnings, that's the median income of people who attended the school 10 years earlier. And who had received federal aid? Because that's you can trace the data if you include the federal aid component. Economic mobility, so that's based on Opportunity Insights and their 2017 analysis uh, to see how somebody moved from income level one income level to another. Economic diversity, um, academic profile, this ACT, SAT, grad rates, SAT, standardized test scores, student faculty ratios, things like that. Racial diversity, and then campus safety information. And so that's some of the information you filter. You go through and you determine what you believe is most important to you. Now you're thinking stuff. Why would you not like this? Well, I like the concept because it's all about the shoe fitting your foot, right? The only thing is I still don't want people to think that this is like gospel because there's a lot of criteria that cannot be considered and factored in if you're using this approach, but it's not a bad starting point. If somebody wants to use it as a starting point to see what it surfaces, just know that it still has its limitations, but you can just go to the New York times 
and look up their own customized rankings. And I think is it at least worth consulting? And it's a recommended resource for episode 411. So talk a little bit about the timeline. Uh, when is sort of the sign up process? Like when does it start? When does it end? What, is, what does that look like? Yeah, I believe it starts March 1st, ends March 31st. We have that in the notes here. And um, when would someone be notified um, if they were selected? It it takes like about, I believe the process is about a week or two where they get the onboarding module training. And it also depends when the coach completes all of this. Because um, mm -hmm. the, the first process of it is completing those onboarding modules. And then we go through the grading process. We manually have to look at the assignments that the coach turned in. And then from there on out, it all depends also on the coach whenever they submit these things because it all gets sent to their email. Um, and then they also have to do that background check piece. And um, it, it might take a bit of time, just it mostly depends on when the coach has the time to complete these steps. And for the person that says, I'm, I'm sold, I, I don't need any more. You've answered all my questions. So their next steps would be to do what? To the sign next, up. Oh, mm -hmm. the next step. If they are interested right now, we do have mm -hmm. a volunteer interest form on our website. And that's also the links that I could share with you and you could put them in the show notes. But they, we have that interest form right now. Um, once the application fully opens on March 1st, we then send them that application. So they're able to fill that out and then go through the process from there on out. But right now, it's just the interest form that we have open. Like I mentioned, we'll send all the actual application once it opens on March 1st. Well, I just want to say, I think that what you guys are doing is awesome. And at your College Bound Kid, you know, our, our mission is to provide college knowledge to all. Uh, we're trying to bridge the, the information gap out there. And um, I want to not only have this interview, but bring up from time to time for new listeners, uh, the work that you guys are doing. And I'm personally going to sign up myself to to be a college match okay. counselor. Yeah, I really am. I really am. I think you're doing really important work. And I think uh, I don't want to just talk the talk. I want to walk the walk. So um, I plan on signing up. And I've already mentioned it to another uh, person I work with. Her name is Jennifer Mandel. And she's from Wisconsin. And she's absolutely loving the scholar match orientation sessions. She's already gone through and signed up as well. So. Uh, we want to support you guys in, in anything we can. But even that we're coming down to the end, no college first-time guest gets away without going on the hot seat. Before we get to that, is there anything that you didn't say about Scholar Match that you want to share? Um, let's see. Was it, like One of the questions like, what's the most rewarding part? And I know that Nora answered it. My answer for that is it never gets old to have a student texts you on the QuestBridge day or say Ivy day or one of the later days in March or April when decisions come out and say like, wow, I got this amazing full ride financial aid package to the college of my dreams and you've transformed my life and the life of my family. Um, I'll, I'll never stop um, being motivated by that sort of message and yeah. That's a great way to end. I love it. I love it. It's all about the joy of giving. Yes, yes. All right. Well, you guys catch a little bit of a break because there's two of you. So you can sort of pick and choose who wants to answer these. I'm not going to call you out by name. But our first question is the best movie you've ever seen. I think there's no greater feeling than watching Interstellar for the first time. <laughs> I remember <laughs> crying when I saw it. It's such a good movie. I think that's that's one of the top movies for me. Have you seen that one as well, Hannah? I have not. I'm not. A oh, I'm not alone. <laughs> I'm I'm sitting over here feeling so bad. <laughs> oh no, I'm terrible at American pop culture. <laughs> <laughs> not as bad as me, trust me. <laughs> All right, the best concert you've ever attended. I went to One Republic. That's the only one I've been to, but it was amazing. Beyonce. I oh, see Beyonce. my, oh, my youngest goodness. daughter still talking about Beyonce in Atlanta. What What <sighs> did you like about Beyonce, uh, oh my Nora? God. Nobody puts on a show like her. Like you could see the work ethic. I also went to go see the movie that she put out of what it takes to create that tour. And oh my God, it's amazing. All the work that goes behind it. It was crazy experiencing it in person. Yeah, that's great. That's great. All right. Favorite animal? 
tortoise or chicken? <laughs> Why? You know, people are like, what's your like pet, like cat or dog? I'm like, oh yeah, I name all these like weird reptiles. Yeah, <laughs> you do. What's with the tortoise fascination over here? <laughs> um, my my family grew up with a tortoise and with chickens. And, oh yeah. well, that that explains it. <laughs> <laughs> Bucket list place that you have to go to before you move on from this world. You got to get there. Peru oh. or Japan? Peru or Japan. Yeah, my oldest daughter, she's a, she has a Spanish tutoring company, but she has a degree in Spanish and she spent six months at a Peruvian university in her junior year. Um, and she raves about it and says all the time, oh, I've got to take the whole family. You guys have to come. So, yeah. So Peru is and and what in Japan, what's the appeal? with? Tell me what's the appeal about Peru and Japan. Um, Peru has great nature and also great cities. Um, I'm Japanese and there's also a good number of Japanese immigrants who have been in Peru. And so there's certain fusion foods like ceviche. Um, yeah, going to, so I grew up in predominantly white neighborhood and went to a predominantly Latina high school, as I mentioned. And so I just feel very much at this melting pot of cultures where um, when I'm around a bunch of Japanese people, I actually don't feel quite as home as when I'm around a bunch of Latina people. And so I feel like Peru might be a place uh, that I might feel very at home, even though I've never been to Peru before. Um, and then Japan is just, yeah, the, that, that would be my motherland. Yeah, so like reconnecting with your new your roots. Yes. With yeah. the chickens and the reptiles and Japan. <laughs> I see a theme here. Get in touch with your roots. <laughs> All right. We have two le left. A book that you recommend for parents or students to read. I can go if you don't want to, Nora. Okay. Uh I read I Am Not Your Perfect Mexican Daughter recently. <laughs> Um, I love that book because it's about a Mexican American teen who is not the most submissive child. Like she's the more rebellious of between her and her sister. And um, that creates conflict with her mom, who is more traditionally Mexican because she has the more American parts of her. That sounds deep. That sounds deep. I love it. And the last question is your best advice to students and parents who are listening. And college Ooh. counselors, seeing as you work with coaches. So best advice to students, parents, and college coaches or future college coaches. I can go I can go for the students. Okay. Um, I would say that it's okay to not have it all figured out right now. I know there's always that pressure to figure out what major you want to start studying or what job you want to start doing. You don't have to have it figured out right now. I didn't figure it out until I was two years into my college experience. So it's okay to change your mind. And I, I think even as an adult too, it's okay to completely take a different route than what you initially were taking. Nora, that is some sage advice that I'm going to have to ask my students to listen to this portion of our interview so they can hear what you just said, because that was profound. Any final words of wisdom for, for you, Hannah, either students, um... parents, or college counselors? So to all of the above, I, I say often that you did the best with what you could and you should be proud of that. Uh, there's always more work that can be done and sometimes it leaves us feeling regretful. Like for example, there is an unlimited number of scholarships in comparison to the amount of time that exists in a day that one could apply to. And so there's always gonna be some that the student isn't going to apply to or with respect to being a college coach, right? Like not trying your best not to feel guilty for not helping the student at 11 30 p.m <laughs> i think know. this 11 okay, 30 p.m person is best, and... is is weighing on your conscience now this has come up a couple times <laughs> <laughs> yes yes and there's always going to be situations that we're not completely familiar with um so going back to your question before of if you're from a more affluent background how can you help uh, students who are from a different background um I'm, I'm again, I'm not from a low income background, but even for those that are, I would say you haven't experienced all of the low income disadvantage experiences that there are. And so, for example, while one student um, might be a black American who's grown up in America, it might be hard to relate or understand the experiences 
um, beforehand before talking to someone who is, say, like a Mexican immigrant. Um, and so coming in with the idea of, all right, I want to understand what this student's motivations are and how their background relates to that is super important. Listen, you guys have been awesome. Um, I think that you've done an amazing overview of Scholar Match. And I'm really excited uh, for us to kind of partner with you and share with our listeners from time to time, you know, the work that you guys are doing and strongly encourage anybody listening who is either a college counselor and wants to help an under-resourced student or someone who just has a heart for this work and the love for kids uh, to reach out and get involved. So thank you so much, Hannah. Thank you, Nora. Yes. Thank you for having us. And now it's time for our College Spotlight of the Week. Friends, last week you heard the first part of our interview. Now it's time for the second part, which will be the final part of our interview. Listen and enjoy. One of the questions I get the most is how are international universities at um, what the UK terms pastoral care? So making sure that students physical health, mental health, things of that nature are being met, making sure students feel like they're at home. And on the whole, the UK does an excellent job of it, a lot better than many other countries. But the standouts there are all in Scotland, and St. Andrews is towards the top of that list. There, One of the negatives of St. Andrews is because it does tend to, because of the internal politics of the United Kingdom, the fee structure for the longest was different for English citizens than it was for Scottish citizens. So it does, and it's quite rare in that regard. It is something that does factor in and the people from the South of England are identified as being a little bit more posh, um, read into that however you want to, but it's a lot of the same sectional differences that, you know, we see in American universities. I think I've mentioned before, my wife's finishing up her law degree at uh, Southern Methodist here in Dallas. And Mark, I remember, you know, you've lived in Dallas for a while. SMU has a number of different student populations and a number of different stereotypes. And I'm going to leave it right there. Um, Or else I might find myself on the couch tonight. (laughs) (laughs) You know, you do this thing, which I think it's awesome. You're always like, I'm going to do my best to be really tactful. And then I know everyone who's halfway listening, all of a sudden they're like 100% tuned in, sitting on your every word to try to figure out what you're saying between the lines. (laughs) Well, you know, just I don't think it's an irony that there's a Neiman Marcus and a Nordstrom about two, not even two miles from SMU's campus. That's all I'm going to say about that. Yeah, it's no doubt it's in Highland Park, right in that area there, University Park, Highland Park. Uh, we were wealthy part of Dallas, no question about it. But that's a special place for me. That's where I studied. Their library was open really, really late. So I'd hang out there till two, three in the morning. It's a beautiful campus. Like it's, and it's an incredible. I'm not the biggest sports person. You know, my wife is college football season is her favorite time of year, but they call it boulevarding as opposed to tailgating because of course they do. And it's incredible. It's so much fun. We we go several Saturdays every year, and it 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 makes watching football worthwhile. Now let's get back to St. Andrews. So yes. so Kevin, you're right. I'm looking at some of my notes. So 145 national nationalities represented. Uh, 45 percent coming from outside of the UK. Um, a tenth from Europe, and the remainder from the rest of the world. 20 percent from North America. Um, and then here's another thing This kind of, it's a little, this is sort of what you were saying. It's the third lowest acceptance rate, you know, behind Oxford and Cambridge for schools over there, highest entry standards for new students that's measured by UCAS. So talk to us a little bit about how hard it is to get in. Talk to us about the profile of the kind of student that you would say would have at least a 50% chance or better of admission? I think the key to it is being able to demonstrate that you know what you want to study and that you're 
doing well in that subject. So a few years ago, I had a student who was knew he wanted to end up at St. Andrews. And we ended up applying via Common App because it made sense for him to apply via Common App because he got the Common App St. Andrews supplement to talk about how he loved St. Andrews and how he could focus in on no matter which way I go with my studies, I know this is the place for me. It's not quite to the level of American universities because St. Andrews does not have to worry about yield protection or anything like that. But St. Andrews is definitely looking for the type of person who wants to fall in love with St. Andrews. Now, the key to that is making sure your grades and if applicable, your test scores are quite good. So we definitely want, if you choose to take the SAT or the ACT, we definitely want those to be quality scores. And what does that mean? Like, you know, I mean, everybody knows that, but they don't know what that means. Because for one school, 1100 is a quality score. And for another school, 1500 is not a quality score. I think you're looking on the SAT at around a 1300 for a lot of subjects at St. Andrews. So I'm not going to say here, sit here and say that that's an, necessarily an easy score to obtain. But it's definitely not the 1450 you would need for Oxford or the 1500 you would need for Cambridge Computer Science. And what about AP scores and IB scores? To what degree are they factored in? Again, here it can really depend. And it, depending on how you do in your classes, in high school classes, and how you can kind of thread that needle, if you have a bad day on the AP exam, it's okay. Typically, they're looking for fours and fives. But if you've demonstrated your interest through other means, and you're doing as well as can be expected at your high school, you're going to be okay. So for example, let's say that you're at a public high school, someplace that's not, shall we say, the suburbs of Washington, DC. Let's say that you're not going to Thomas Jefferson School for Science and Technology, mm-hmm. where most students don't take AP exams, and you self-studied for the AP world history test. You took world history honors and you got an A in it, but you self-studied for an AP test and you got a, a three. That's going to be the sort of self-starter mindset that's going to impress St. Andrews. Is a three going to get you in? Maybe, maybe not. But the fact that you've gotten an A and you've pushed yourself harder in your studies, that's going to stand out to them. Again, it's making sure that you are falling in love with St. Andrews for the right reasons and being able to talk about the reading you've done in your subject, all the things that typically matter in elite UK university are really going to stand out here. It's just that if you've got an extracurricular that maybe matters a little bit more, say your high school didn't offer AP comparative politics, but you did model UN and you did a great job with model UN, then that's going to stand out. Talk to me a little bit about the the individual schools. So I know there's United College, St. Mary's, and St. Leonard's, right? And and um, I know United is got the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, medicine. Um, and my understanding is it's based around the St. Salvador's quadrangle, where St. Mary's is mostly Faculty of Divinity. And then when you get St. Leonard's, you're talking about a lot of postgraduate stuff. Um, anything that we should know about those those different schools? For most undergrads, it's largely irrelevant. It's okay. a holdover of an earlier time. And, you know, the, with the exception of the School of Divinity, most undergraduate subjects are all under the same umbrella anyway. So it's definitely some, sort of a quirk to be made aware of, but it's it's not something like the colleges at Oxford or Cambridge where it's important to know about. What about the teaching style and the, and the class size and things like that? Like anything you want to share on that? I think you'll find it's much more similar to an American university in that regard. There are going to be smaller seminar style classes. It's again, St. Andrews really comes across, and I think this is a key to their success, as maybe not a small liberal arts college. There are certainly some that fill that role better in Europe and the UK specifically, but a highly intensive small public research university. You know, it makes sense that they're partnered so closely with William and Mary, because from my experience there, and you know, that was 20 years ago, so I'd like mm-hmm. to think that it wasn't that long mm-hmm. ago, the smaller class sizes, the opportunity to build a relationship with a professor, 
um, those things matter. It's not in Europe or in the UK in general, you're not going to have a lot of teaching assistants doing classes um, outside of a situation like at Oxford or Cambridge where you have a tutorial or a supervision where it's, you know, three students in there with you. But generally, again, St. Andrews is doing everything right for the student who wants to be at St. Andrews. And that's the key is that if you're, if you're the sort of person who needs a social life that revolves around more than say a town of 20,000 people, or you want easy access to travel um, elsewhere in the UK without having to go an hour into Edinburgh each way, St. Andrews is a great fit. What kind of, how much should somebody expect to pay? Like all in travel, That's the kicker. room, That's board, where things everything. get interesting. Yeah. Talk so, to us about money. Do they do like, you know, differential tuition based on what you, your field of study or is it, t- just give us a sense. Is there merit money? What are you looking at? Uh, you're not there? looking at a lot of merit money. And mm-hmm. the, you know, one of my big driving points is go to the UK, study in three years and four. And, you know, I, you know, you look at it and I actually did a Instagram post on this not so long ago. It is cheaper to go to Oxford than it is to go to a lot of schools in Virginia. Um, cough, cough, William and Mary cough, cough as an in-state student. <laughs> it's they're still going to ask me for money. It's okay. And I'm still going to give. It's okay. I don't think they listen to our podcast, so you're safe. It's about the same price to go to Oxford as it is to go to Stan. You know, and Oxford's typically one of the more expensive options I can dream up because you have to mm-hmm. pay extra tuition for um, the college fees, same at Cambridge. At Scottish universities, especially St. Andrews, because there's almost never an option to enter as a second year student. Um, You sometimes see that at Glasgow or Edinburgh, but St. Andrews, it's almost never. You're looking at paying between 22 and 33,000 pounds per year, plus your living expenses. So it comes out to all in. You're doing that pounds thing again, man. I need you to convert it to dollars. (laughs) <laughs> it comes in all in um, around for the four years, around a quarter of a million dollars, which in anything other than buying a house or higher education is a ton of, well, and hopefully someone's, you know, retirement accounts is a ton of money, but still about 25,000 less than the most expensive schools over here per year. Cause you're talking, you're talking 60, 62 a year versus right. here. I mean, we've got, Several that hit 90 this year, all in cost of attendance. Right. And a lot more in the 80s. That is cost of attendance. That is factoring in some flexibility with exchange rates. That's factoring in that you're going to want to travel home twice a year, once in winter, once probably um, in the summer. And also, you're in Europe. You should have a budget built in to, you know, not feel bad about taking that easy jet flight to Munich. You know. There you go. Kev, this has been great. This is a, a really popular school. One I wanted you to to not only do a spotlight, but shine the spotlight on it. Any any final thoughts? Anything you didn't say you'd want our listeners to know about St. Andrews? You know, I'll be honest. When I first got started in this, because it was so popular, you know, the the kind of thing to do is to try to find reasons to not like St. Andrews. <laughs> and honestly. If you take St. Andrews for what it is, you don't build it up as any more romantic ideal than that, which is a hard thing to do because it is such a great place. But if you recognize that you're going to be there for four years and it's isolated, it's if you go into it open minded about those things and really just embracing that, it's an incredible school. And I think it's only going to get more popular and it, it may become more competitive for entry. So it's definitely something worth considering on that front. But it's it's a dream school for a lot of people for a very good reason. You know, there's a, a part of me that's, you know, I like history and there's a there's a part of me that's kind of fascinated by the links it has to the United States. You know, because um, I was reading that uh, James Wilson, who was a signer of the Declaration of Independence, he attended uh, St. Andrews. Um, and he was one of the six original justices appointed by George Washington, uh, to the Supreme court. 
um, and also one of the founders of UPenn's Law School. And there's just been a lot of other connections with a lot of famous, prominent Americans um, with St. Andrews, including Andrew Carnegie, you know, very famous person in this country, known for a lot of a lot of things. And it just kind of goes on and on and on. You had Bobby Jones, you know, founder of Augusta and the Masters. And right. it's just been a long list. But I, I part of me wonders, because, you know, William and Mary is like what well, you would know. Is it the third or fourth oldest school in the country? It's founded second. in the 60s. Second oldest. Duh. Yeah. So, oh, that is beating to our heads. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you think about it. You're starting a school then. You probably are looking to, I mean, St. Andrews was founded, what, 1404, 1410? I've seen two different numbers, so something like uh, that. Let's, something it's like right that. there on there. 1413. 1413. See, I'm off again, but in the low 1400s. So you're talking about a school that's like 250, more than 250 years older. You probably are looking to schools like that for advice. So I wouldn't be surprised if there literally are historical connections you know, from not only for William and Mary, but probably all of our very, very first schools that go back there. Um, but yeah, the history is fascinating. To me. I've never been, but you've uh, whet my appetite to get there. Thanks, Kev. No, my pleasure. You should totally go. <laughs> I know you. You're Mr. International. You got me going everywhere. <laughs> Next thing you know, you'll have me in Iraq and Iran. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tempt me. <laughs> On Monday's episode, we'll have a question for a listener, but we haven't picked it yet. And then we'll have the final part. Uh, actually, then we'll have part two of three with Andy Strickler. He's breaking down Connecticut College. And friends, remember, college is not a prize to be won. It is a match to be made. And one way you can test yourself on this Ask yourself this, do you feel if a school is more selective than another school, then you automatically need to go to it because it's more selective? If you do, then that's demonstrating that you have a prize to be won mentality. Now, if you say selectivity is really, really important to me, but I'm also looking at other factors, and I may pick a school that's less selective over a school that's more selective, then that indicates that you have a match to be made mentality. Remember. College is a match to be made. It is not a prize to be won. See you Monday, friends. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. If you find this podcast helpful, please follow us and you'll get every single episode as soon as it is released. If you're interested, there are a few ways you can really support our podcast. You can click the share button and send it to your friends and acquaintances. You can help us pay our staff and our expenses by donating on our website. You can write a review for us on Apple or Spotify. I'm the producer of the podcast, but we have a fantastic team of 15. Shout out to our co-host, Dr. Lisa Ruff, Dr. David Williams, Linda Depker, Susan Tree, Vince Garcia, and Julia Esquivel. And to our substitute co-host, Sylvia Borgo. Our sensational sound engineer is Nemanja Matvich. Our amazing music is from Victor Allen Weeks. Marketing designs are from Kimberly Blass. Lily Parikh manages our Instagram. Our image editor is Talha Khan. Joyce Ducker does our website episode updates. And our webmaster is Stylianos Dimitru. And if you want to have a coaching session with Lisa, Linda, or me, just text me at 404-664-4340. If you have a question you want us to answer, or if you have a recommended resource or article you think we should discuss, just send it to questions at your collegeboundkid.com. Our favorite method is for you to record your own voice at speakpipe.com forward slash YCBK. By the way, check out our website where you'll find lots of content that is not on any podcast app. Our website is your collegeboundkid.com. If you want to learn about other hot admissions topics, follow us on Twitter at YCBK Podcast. We think of you as our listening family, and we look forward to meeting again with you every single Monday and Thursday.